Mark chapter 10, and I'd like to begin reading with verse 1. Then he, and the he is Jesus, arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of Jordan. And the people gathered to him, and as he, as, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? And he answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let, us not, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Then they brought young children to him and that he might touch them. But the disciples re rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. But surely I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. May God bless me to his word, may be sanctify in our hearts. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we just bow before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you again, Lord, for the time just to come together around your word in its uh, simplicity. And we pray, Lord, that you would open it to us and give us understanding and enlightenment and insight. And we pray, Father, that your people will have ready hearts and minds to receive your engrafted word, which is able to save their very soul. Speak a good word to us today. And we'll be ever so careful to give your name all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is very possible that the United States Supreme Court in this current session is going to take a look at a case that would determine whether or not the various states who have established laws uh, that recognize same-sex marriages would be constitutional, and whether or not the Cal state of California's law, which doesn't recognize same-sex marriages, would be constitutional. Either way we go, we're in for potentially a decision that would mean a, a tectonic shift uh, in the cultural mores of our country. Uh, the latest polls basically show that it's getting somewhere between 55 to 60 percent of people in the United States of America basically support uh, same-sex marriages. And the percentage is much higher among young people that are under 40 years of age, and it doesn't matter that much whether in the church or outside of the church, the views of younger people are pretty much uh, the same. And so we're, we're in this place of uncharted waters, uncharted territories as a nation, and also as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. As I've shared with you before on this particular issue and on many issues, the real issue is going to be over the scripture as to whether or not the Bible will serve as the final authority for the faith and practice, not for the society, because the society at large long rejected the Bible as the final authority uh, to base moral laws on in our culture. But will it be the final authority of faith and practice for the church? Because one of the greatest debates and greatest discussion is taking place not out in the secular society, but it's in the context of the church itself as to whether or not what the Bible 
has been uh, led to believe that they're taught in the past will stand as an ongoing direction and direct, uh, director for, for the church. Now, a few months ago, when uh, our president, Barack Obama, announced to the nation that he had changed his position, and if you remember the context of his, his presentation, and here, not quoting him verbally, but the essence of what he said was this, is that he has changed his position over marriage. When he was running as candidate Barack Obama, his position was that a marriage was between a man and a woman, unequivocally. That was his position. But he later changed the position, and he changed his position based on two things. Number one, the observation of his children's uh, friends, parents. He says, my children have friends, and their parents are in same-sex relationships. They're loving, caring relationships. That was number one. The second foundational point for his change in position was that he had people that worked for him in his administration that were loyal, that were faithful, that were committed to him and discharging their responsibility, and they were in loving, caring, same-sex uh, marriages. They don't know y'all get mad at me. I know y'all love President Barack Obama, and so do I. But when somebody puts something out there publicly, it's for public consumption. And so when he puts his position out there and how he arrived at that position, then people like myself and others, you know, we have the right to kind of look at it and analyze it and say, what does this really mean? So the things that raise the red flag for me is that he professes to be a Christian. And so nowhere in the changing of his position does he make any reference to an enlightened understanding, enlightened insight, insight from the scripture. But instead, his shift in position was based on experiences of his children, their playmates and their parents, and his experience in engaging with people that worked for him and people that he knows. Now, that's why I say the problem is going to be with the church. When the Bible speaks to an issue as Christians, then it is our responsibility to do our diligence to say, well, what does the Bible actually teach? Then we can come to a conclusion and say, well, we don't really believe that that should have been in the Bible. That's a legitimate position was to take, to say, we don't think it should have been in there. We think that men put that in there. We're not sure if God intended for it to be in there. That's a separate argument. But we do have to say, what is in there? <laughs> and what's in there, what did this have to say? And then once we determine what the Bible says, then we can have a discussion as to whether or not we're going to base, base our beliefs on what the Bible says. Are you following me? Now, I'm just trying to get back to the Bible because historically, the church has had what the theologians, theologians call a Judeo-Christian world in life view. What does that mean? It's just a fancy way of saying that the church has looked at the world through the lens of the Jewish Bible from Genesis to Malachi and the Christian Bible from Matthew to the Revelation. The way the church had looked at the society has been through the lens of the scripture and the church has tried to come to positions based on what the scripture taught. It does not mean that we've always been right. As a matter of fact, the church has been grossly wrong in many of its interpretations and how it's interpreted many things. It was the church that led a lot of the Salem witch hunts where women were burned at the stakes because someone in the church thought that they were a witch. It was the church that basically gave theological and biblical cover for the United States of America when the decision was being made whether or not race-based slavery was going to come to this new world. This was the, the debate was that was being held because some of the first people who came over here said that they were Christian and they were leaving the mother country, England, to come here for religious expression. So then they got here and they got to have the same conversation. Are we going to bring race-based slavery from the old world to the new world? It was the church that says that race-based slavery is consistent with Christianity. The church gave cover. It was the church, basically, that gave cover to the whole institution of segregation. 
particularly in the South. The last resistance to desegregation was the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the dominant Christian denomination all over the world, and by far the largest denomination in the United States of America. And it was the Southern Baptist Church that resisted desegregation. And it wasn't until less than 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, when the Southern Baptist Church finally apologized for the position that it had taken historically on slavery and on segregation. So just because the church takes a position does not mean that the position that the church takes is correct because we have been grossly wrong in many cases. Let me tell you another one we've been hugely wrong at. In this country, when they were debating whether or not drugs would be made illegal, there was no such thing as an illegal drug in the United States of America until 1914. For the first 140 years of this country, these drugs like cocaine, uh, like heroin, uh, opium, they were freely traded. Marijuana freely traded. They were freely consumed in this country. And they became inextricably woven into the economic fiber of this nation through the international trade with these other countries. And they became inextricably woven into the fabric of the recreational scene in this country. Most people don't even realize that. So when they were debating whether or not they would could control drugs, the Supreme Court and the United States Congress did not believe that they could tell a person what to put in their mouth. They thought the United States Constitution right to privacy protected a private citizen's right to consume whatever they wanted to take in their mouth. And a congressman by the name of Francis Burton Harrison came up with a novel idea. He says, we can let people take whatever they want to take, we're just going to tax it. So the first drug law was the Harrison Tax Act of 1914, and basically it placed a tax on heroin, on cocaine, and on opium which was the first group of drugs that was originally controlled. They were not illegal, it's just that a pharmacist and a doctor could prescribe them, and they could only be prescribed in a doctor's process of administering medicine. But let me tell you what happened, this is kind of amazing. It was the church that said that addiction is not a disease. The church says this in 1915. And they say anybody that's taking drugs need to be prosecuted under the full extent of the law, and the church wanted drug addicts to be incarcerated. And we started incarcerating drug addicts. And it went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, 1919, the Webb case. The Supreme Court rules in 1920 that addiction is not a disease. Therefore, you cannot use any drug to treat someone as a drug addict. We were as wrong as two left shoes. As wrong as two left shoes. As a matter of fact, the whole war on drugs that we're currently dealing with was instigated by the church. It was the church that wanted this war on drugs declared. They went to Franklin Roosevelt, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt in the early 1900s, had him to convene an international summit to try to deal with the drug trade. And the current modern drug laws have their genesis back to 1906 and 1914. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. We have been grossly wrong on some major issues as the church. That's why we have to be very careful before we get up on our spiritual hobby horses thing just because we say something that makes it right and make it correct. Now, having said all of that, we still have to do our due diligence to try to figure out what does the Bible teach, particularly when you're dealing with these weighty social issues that have incredible, incredible ramifications for the culture and for the society. And so yes, we have to understand this and we've got to take a position on this and we cannot be neutral. I'm not going to fall out with any Christian person or non-Christian regardless of which side of this issue they come down on. I'm just going to challenge Christians to say, have you went through the Bible and have you arrived at your position based on what the Bible teaches? If you choose to say, well, I reject that part of the Bible, just know that's what you're doing. But don't try to say the Bible says something that it doesn't say. Let the Bible say what it says, and then you can say, well, I don't believe that God really meant that to be in there. And you can decide if you want to be the editor of the text. That, that, that's your choice. Because the Bible is a lot more complicated than what we think it is, and it came to us in a way that's a lot more complicated than what we think in, in terms of how it came. So there's, there's open for conversation discussion, but our responsibility first is to figure out what does the Bible say. Now, having said all of that, here we go. 
They come to Jesus, they meaning the religious leaders. Why? Because marriage was a very controversial issue in the first century of Palestine or Israel. It was a very, very controversial issue within the Jewish community. I'm not talking about Rome where they practice polygamy and a lot of other type of grossly immoral thing. I'm talking about within the most religious people on the earth, the Jewish people. And the issue for them was, can a man divorce his wife because she burnt the bagels? Can a man divorce his wife because she didn't wash his clothes properly? Because she didn't serve him the meal that he wanted? That is, that's, exa that's exactly how extreme it was. There were two leading thoughts that one, a man could only divorce his wife for sexual immorality and sexual immorality only. The other one was he could divorce her for whatever reason he found that she was no longer pleasing and acceptable in his sight. Those two opinions were offered to the Jews, the Jewish men. Which one do you think they chose? <laughs> That's why this was so controversial. These were the two thoughts. You can put her away because you find someone else younger and nicer looking and that you want to be with, and you can find a reason to say she's no longer pleasing in your sight. They bring this to Jesus because they know this is a major, complicated, controversial issue, and they say there's no way he can give us an answer that's not going to anger somebody. Somebody's going to be mad at whatever answer he comes up with. So they bring this to Jesus. Of all the things they could have brought to him, of all the questions, of all the issues, they bring the question and the issue that had the most emotion in the Jewish community. And they come to Jesus with it to trap him, to pin him, and impale him on a dilemma to whereby he gets discombobulated and can't explain it, and therefore they can disqualify him as being a master teacher. When these things come from the Bible, it's pretty serious. These are extremely intelligent people. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, these were the brilliant theological intellectuals. They were not just every common day folk. They have spent their entire lives studying the scripture, understanding the scripture, and coming up with interpretations of the text. They were very well read. They were literally brilliant. Remember Paul, when Paul gives his pedigree, in the book of Philippians, he talks about being a Pharisee of Pharisees, exceeding those in his contemporaries. In other words, Paul says, at the tender age of 30, I was considered one of the theological, intellectual members of Judaism. I was a member of the Sanhedrin, the 71 most powerful people in the town, who were lawyers, who were litigators, who were theologians. This is who's coming to Jesus. And he's just an itinerant carpenter preacher from Nazareth. So they are confident that they can come up with questions to force him to address that will basically get him tied up in all types of knots. They thought about the question they bring to him. You know, in another text they bring to him, remember what they bring to him, the question, all's about marriage. A man is married to a woman. He dies. He has six brothers. They all die. Who gets her in the resurrection? And I'm thinking to myself, who wants her in the resurrection? But point is, marriage was central to Jewish life. And so they come to Jesus with this. So look at verse 10, chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus moves uh, on the other side of Jordan. He's teaching the Pharisees, come verse 2. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Test him. Man, he's come out of the clear blue sky. I don't think he was teaching about this. But they interrupt his teaching session and say, can a man divorce his wife? Now watch what Jesus does. So that is... The, 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 the problem that they posed to him, can a man divorce his wife? He answered and said to them, what did Moses command you? Now the reason they just asked him, can a man divorce his wife, they want to see what position does he hold. Is he going to hold the extremely conservative position only for adultery? He, is he going to hold the liberal position any, for any reason? Which position is he going to hold? They're trying to get him to show his hand. But Jesus is a biblicist. So he says, you guys are the theologians. You guys are the experts. You guys are the master of the law. What did Moses command you? What did Moses say? Let's go back to the Bible. Now, this is important because Jesus uses the authority of the Bible that he had at his disposal at that day to shape his views on issues. He brings them back to Moses. Now look at their little nuanced response to Jesus. When he calls, let's take a look at the perspective of Moses. 
verse 4. They said, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. Now, first of all, they're kind of lying on Moses. Because Moses looking at these rascals and looking at how badly they were treating the women. And so Moses very reluctantly said, if you don't want to be with her, you're not going to just meet, treat her and treat her any kind of way. So if you don't want to be with her, then you've got to give her a bill of divorce. But you can't keep her as a slave under your grip when you really don't want to be with her. But look at Deuteronomy chapter 24. Because they're misrepresenting what Moses actually had instructed and taught. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, here's what the text says. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some uncleanliness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband distests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she's been defiled, for this is an abomination before the Lord, and you should not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Now, I don't have time to get into all of this. But Moses is saying that marriage is so sacred before God, you guys are so wicked and simple before God, I'm going to try to protect the institution of marriage. And what he says to, to the man is you just cannot mistreat her. If you don't want her, then you have to give her a certificate of divorce. You have to release her from being bound to you. So the idea of the divorce that Moses has allowed really was an allowance to protect the woman. And protecting her against this original husband, say if she is divorced and marry another man, then you can't go and claim her back if that man dies. He's trying to protect the institution of marriage. Are you following me? Now what they tried to do, they tried to take this allowance that Moses gave them, they twisted it and said, Moses commanded us to do this. Only if you were a dirty, as Robert Ely might say, a no good, dirty, rotten scoundrel who were going to mistreat your wife. So he shares the perspective of Moses. Now back to Genesis, back to Mark chapter 10. Verse 4, they said Moses permitted a man to write a stick of divorce and to miss her. Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you the precept. It's because of your sinfulness, your wickedness, your decadence, your propensity to dominate, to mistreat, and to take advantage of the woman in a society where she did not have the type of legal rights that she has today. She didn't have recourse to the court. There was no appeal that she could make. So he says, Moses did that to protect her from you. But... But, Jesus says, from the beginning. Again, Jesus is a biblicist. So he's shaping his world and life view from the scripture. From what the scripture actually teaches. Because he says, in the scripture, God has laid down timeless principles. We very often don't live up to them. We fail. We fall short of the principle. But we cannot lower the principle so it qualifies us to make us feel better. The principle is still the principle. When we fall short, that's why there's grace. That's why there's mercy. That's why there's forgiveness. Because we're going to fall short of the standard. But what God is saying, don't bring the standard down, because in bringing the standard down, you're trotting on the holiness of God and for God's right to establish what the standard is. This is major what we're discussing in this country today. And that's why I say this is about the authority of the Bible. What does the Bible teach? And that's why I was thrilled that the History Channel did 10-hour episodes about the Bible to get people thinking about the Bible and maybe some of them will blow the dust off it and open it and start to read it. And that's why I was glad if you noticed during the Bible show, 
they had this promotion for the free Bible app that you could download the whole Bible for free. So in this day and age of iPads and iPods and technology, you can have it in your hand and maybe someone will just accidentally flip on the app where they're trying to get this, whatever something else is going on and the Bible will come up on the app. And maybe someone will read it. You see, what does it say? Jesus was a biblicist. He takes them back to the scripture, back to the book of Genesis. So Jesus referenced Genesis as, is, as if it was indeed the word from God and the word of God through his choice servant, Moses. So what did Jesus do? He says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now this is interesting. This is, this is very interesting. It is very powerful and it is very insightful. Jesus go back to the plan from the beginning in Genesis 1, 27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So Jesus takes them back to Genesis. The plan from the very beginning was that they would be male and female. God created them male and female. And why did he do that? Why did he do that? God made them male and female for a purpose. The purpose, the reason that they were made male and female was for the purpose of marriage. God defines marriage. I'm not defining it. God defines it in the text in Genesis 1. He created them in the beginning, male and female, created he them. And he created them male and female for the purpose of marriage. Look at Genesis 2.4. In Genesis 2.4, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant, before any plant of field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, the Lord God had called it not to rain on the earth. Now, I may come back. I really want to go to Genesis 2.24. I'm sorry. I said 2.4. Genesis 2.24. We get the full context. You got to back up to verse 18. Take them back to verse 18, Brother Donald. And the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him, suitable for him, equal to him, to compliment him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam had called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave name to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable, suitable, complementary to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman of man, out of man, and he brought her to the man. Now, Jesus takes them back to Genesis to establish the plan that God had for male and female and the plan that God had for marriage. In the beginning, he says, God creates them this way. And God causes deep sleep to come upon the man. He takes the rib from his side so that she would be genetically and DNA, his equal, would have the very same essence of him Therefore, the perfect complement to him and the perfect partner suitable for him and having the same genetic DNA would be in every way his equal. Look what God does. There's no way that she could be in any way inferior to him because God made her out of the stuff that was in him. Therefore, she had to have the same essence, the same value, the same worth, that he had. That's what Jesus is disclosing here. 
So without even saying it, he says, you guys are plumb out of your mind to think you are superior to women in any way. It is impossible for you to be superior to women in any way because you are made from the same stuff. You came out of the ground. She came out of you. Therefore, she came from the ground. You both came from the same stuff. You have the same essence, the same value, and the same worth. But in the plan of God, you will have a different function in the perpetuation of the human race. And this is really deep because Adam and Eve had the closest relationship of two people in the history of the planet. No people have had this type of relationship. Literally, Eve was Adam's wife. Eve was Adam's sister, and Eve was Adam's daughter. All three. Let me tell you why. She was Adam's wife because God created her to be Adam's wife. She was Adam's sister because they both had the same father, and they were created both by direct fiat from God. So anybody directly created by God is the son or the daughter of God. That's why when you read the genealogy, I think it's in Matthew, when he goes back to Adam, he says, and Adam was the son of God. So they both are children of God. She's his wife, she's his sister, and she is his daughter because she came out of him. She came out of him. And then God creates her a little bit differently, he gives her something that Adam does not have. She has a womb. And in her womb, her womb has the capacity to receive Adam's seed, which will fertilize her egg and produce children. This was God's plan. And that is what Jesus is saying. By taking them back to Genesis, he said when you look at God's original plan, he made them male and female for the purpose of marriage. Therefore, in the Bible, there is no allowance for any definition of marriage other than male or female. It's the only way that the Bible defines marriage. Now, we can come up with different definitions in the society if we want to. But we cannot use the Bible as the authority to support our opinion. We can find some other book but not the scripture. That's why I say this is a battle for the Bible. It's a battle what does the Bible teach? It is clear. And that's why when the issue of marriage came to Jesus, he takes them back to Genesis because he says Genesis establishes the plan of God. It establishes the plan that God had for marriage. It defines what God intended for a marriage to be. Well, I'm almost through. So, the plan from the beginning, God made the male and female for the purpose of marriage. And then look at what Adam then says. When God brings a woman to the man, in verse 20 through, Adam said, this is now, wow, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of me. Therefore, a man shall leave mama and father and be joined to his wife, and they should become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So what is Jesus doing? He's just saying, this is what the Bible teaches. This was God's plan for marriage. That there would be male and female, they would come together, and they would have the capacity to procreate if it was God's will. That they would become one. That they will become one in vision, one in goal, one in mission, one in their desire to glorify God. So the purpose is that they might become one. Now let me wrap this up and we'll, we'll stop right here because we got to do communion here in a minute. So then Jesus goes on to say, verse 6, from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So he had, this is a permanent deal. In the mind of God, it was intended to be a permanent deal. Are people going to fail? Absolutely. Will they need to be forgiven? Absolutely. Will God forgive? Absolutely. But we still have to say this was God's original plan, purpose, and intent. Let me tell you how dangerous this is for the church. 
It's dangerous when we start tinkering around with what Jesus said. Now, a lot of people tinker around what Paul said. See, a, lot of, a lot of churches today, they don't, even, they don't accept Paul's 13 or 14 books. They just say Paul was a male chauvinist pig. He don't know what he was talking about. He was one of the original 12 disciples, anyhow, so, apostles. So we don't accept Paul. I'm the whole denomination that don't even study the writings of the apostle Paul. That's where the church is. In this town. In this town. Some of the largest churches in this town. Or they come across something, they say, well, that was Paul's bias. Even when Paul comes and says, but I had the mind of Christ. They call Paul a liar. You didn't have the mind of Christ. You had a bias. Now it's getting down to the red print. The red print now is under salt. It's what the fellow who we captured his words in red, and he takes us back to Genesis, and he referenced back to the Old Testament as being the authoritative word of God, as the only written word of God during his time and era. So he supported his whole ministry based on the Old Testament. So now we're going to say, well, Jesus didn't get it right either. He didn't quite understand what his father intended for him to say, even though he was the exact representation, the express image of his father. He didn't know what he was saying, even though he was in the beginning with God and he was the word of God, but when he came down to explain his stuff, he couldn't explain it right. This is dangerous. We are headed down a road of spiritual heresy, and if we're not careful as the church, we will try to accommodate to the mores and the social movements of the society. That is not the church's role. Our role is not to give legitimacy to the customs, to the mores, to the social values of the society and make people feel better. Our role is not to be a thermometer that re responds to the spiritual temperature and the barometric pressure in the atmosphere. Our role is to be a thermostat to say, oh no, 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 this is what the temperature is. And we're going to control it inside the church. And inside the church, we are the thermostat, and we say, no, this is what God says, this is what he means, and this is how it applies to us. And then our prophetic role to the society is to say, this is the way you should walk in it. If you choose not to walk in it, you're walking at your own peril and your own danger and your own destruction. And this is where we are as a nation. And so that's why even the president does not escape Scrutiny, his words has to be scrutinized and say, all right, you have decided that you're going to base your, va your value, your understanding, your belief on what marriage is based on your children's friends and the people that work for you. That's fine if you want to do that. That's your choice. And the rest of the nation can follow that if they want to. But the church, we've got to say we believe this is what the Bible teaches on this issue. And we're going to love people. We're not going to be mean to people. We're not going to be hateful toward people. We're not going to be condemning people to hell because we don't have a hell to put them in, but God does. And we will leave those type of judgments to God. But it's important that we have theological and doctrinal clarity inside the church. And I've heard some of the largest preachers in America trying to justify President Barack Obama's position. I'm saying that is not our role. Our role is not to justify some politician's position. That's not our role. Our role is to declare this is God's position based on the scripture and let people decide what they want to believe. Well, then, you can tell how important something is to Jesus if he repeats it. We repeat stuff just because we kind of lose our chain of thought. We re repeat stuff because we just kind of redundant. Jesus repeated things for emphasis. And so the disciples come to the Lord and they ask him a question again, verse 10. And the house, the disciples asked him again about the same matter. That's just how important this was. That's how controversial it was. They had heard what he told the religious leaders, and they would say, man, Jesus got the most conservative of all positions. I mean, he's talking about this is pretty serious. 
And so then Jesus says to the disciple in the house, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery against him. Now the context is you're just going to do it because you don't want to be with him no more. No, no reason, no justification, no, you just don't want to do it. You can find somebody else you want it. You can't do that. That is serial polygamy is what it is. You can't do that and not say you're really trying to honor God. Are you following me? Now, the nexus here, and I think I can finish up this next little paragraph, it is interesting, it is very interesting that on the very heels of dealing with marriage, the issue of children come up. The issue of children come up on the very heel of dealing with marriage. So then he brought the young children to him and that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. It was no different than our society today. As we talk about children are the future, but we're spending all the money on the present. <laughs> if you look at where we're spending the money, someone did a study on how much money that we're spending right now on ourselves, how much debt it is creating in the future for our children. So we talk about them being the future, but they're not going to be anything in the future but debt. And so they, they interviewed me the other day, some of you may have saw it, on the PBS, and uh, the woman asked me a question. I said, well, you know, we got over a billion dollars, a billion plus dollars in the rainy day fund. A billion plus dollars. West Virginia is one of the few nations, few states in the nation that got a surplus. We got over a billion dollars. But we have the worst outcomes collectively for children than any state in the United States of America. When you talk about child abuse and neglect, you talk about child poverty, you talk about child obesity, you talk about poor academic performance, you go on down the line and we rank at number 50 or 51 on all issues relating to childhood well-being. Kids Count just put out a report. I told the governor's chief of staff this. Y'all ought to quit saying we got a billion dollar surplus and sticking your check out. You ought to quit saying that. I said, that would be just like me going all over the west side and the east end and me bragging about I got a million dollars in the bank and look at my million dollars and look at my check stuff, but my kids are hungry, they sick, my grandkids are malnourished, look like they're emaciated, and I'm bragging about how much money I got. And we're bragging about how much money we got stored up and our children are going to hell and they didn't, not even a handbasket. So Jesus prioritizes for the religious leaders. He says, look, you guys are keeping the kids from me. Let the children come to me. Because many of them don't have parents. And they got parents who divorced each other, leaving each other, fighting, fussing, and arguing. The kids need me. Let the children come to me. Because I'm all they really got. And you better look at them because it takes their simple childlike faith, humility, and trust even be saved in the first place. So Jesus, he touched the kids. He rebuked those who rebuked those who bought the children. And he commends childlike faith. I think these things go together. Because why is our nation in a crisis? Our nation is in a crisis because Families have disintegrated like a cheap sweater. Our nation is in a crisis because 77% of all black kids are born in a family where the father is not there. A high percentage of them never will have a meaningful relationship with their, with their father. Our nation is in a crisis because the poorest adults in the world are single mothers with children. And the poorest people in the world are the children of those single mothers. That's why our nation is in a crisis. So if there ever was a time that we need to be ta talking about marriage and family and what it should look like and how do we strengthen it and how we bring it together, it is now. Instead, we are totally confused. We are totally confused about what needs to happen. And that's why the church is the last hope. It's the last hope. Try to encourage people to get married, try to encourage people to stay married, 
and people that aren't married, try to make them feel a part of a family, try to encourage them, try to help these single mothers, and no use in criticizing them, aligning them, and castigating them, these single moms with these kids. We got to try to help them. We got to challenge them. We got to encourage them. We got to do everything we can to help them. Because we can help them with their children. Their children have a chance to be the social security for their mothers. Are y'all listening to me? One of my saddest things in my life, it was not just that my mother died when I was 23 years old. It's that she died just when I got in a position where I could help take care of her. And that's what I wanted to do. Because she had sacrificed everything to take care of us, and she never had nothing. And I didn't get that chance. And we got to raise kids who love their mamas and their grandmamas. And the daddies, if you can find them. Because we're going to need to take care of our people. The government don't have any money, y'all. None. No money. And we're going to have to take care of our people. We're going to have to take care of the senior citizens. Because there's not going to be a, the caregivers. And Do you know how much it costs to go to one of these homes? Call them. Call up there to Charleston Gardens. Call up there and ask them how much does it cost for someone to live up here for a month? And once you get up off the floor, call me and tell me what they told you. Because you're going to have sticker shock. And so you know why I pray for Deacon Mitchell, Ms. Mitchell, why I pray for Hetty, Scott, why I pray for Salika? Because that's what a lot more of us are going to have to do. We're going to have to take care of the senior people. A lot of these people work long and hard and never made much money. They don't have no retirement. They ain't got no RAs, no 401ks. So if our kids don't get an education, where they can get a job and make some money, how are we going to take care of our people? I'm not just talking. Look at the demographics. We're the oldest state in the union. We're the sickest state in the union. We take more medication than anybody else taking in the union by far. And we're headed for just a terrible situation. Now, don't take my word for it. There's an article in the newspaper yesterday, not yesterday, this past week. I'm sure some of y'all saw it. Gallo did another survey. I wish they'd stop doing these surveys. And he came back and he says, Charleston and Huntington. Anybody see it? <laughs> Charleston and Huntington got the saddest people, <laughs> the most <laughs> happy people. <laughs> I mean, it's just depressing. Every time you pick the paper, how, how we be number one and number two in the whole United States of America? And the sad thing about that, that's what we're saying about ourselves. It's not what somebody else is saying. It's what we say when we ask the questions for the survey. That's why we need the church, man. We need the church to get happy again, to have some joy again, to have some hope again. They realize that we're not the end of the world. I go someplace and they say, well, West Virginia is the end of the world. They say, no, no, it's not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from West Virginia. <laughs> well, let's just keep, up the name, keep lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep holding up his, his banner. and Keep trusting and believing in him. And I believe that God will use us as a church who wants to be true to his word to reach young people, middle-aged people, older people. And we're not called to change the way everybody thinks. We are called to be an alternative. Amen? Well, I apologize for going over my time. I will probably do the same thing next week. No, I won't.